CGTN, China Global Television Network. The Republic of Mauritius sits off the southeast coast of Africa. To most of the world, Mauritius is famous for its pristine beaches, turquoise waters, and wildlife that are unique to this tropical island. But beyond the palm fringe coastlines that circle Mauritius lies an even richer story. The story of a rising financial powerhouse, a vibrant and diverse tourism sector, and a masterclass in the fusion of the world's cultures. On this special episode of Talk Africa, we explore the stories behind the country's growth and the measures Mauritius is taking to mark its place in Africa and the world. I am Liu Feifei. Welcome to Talk Africa. From sandy shores that stretch out along the Mauritian coastline to dense forests that sit further inland, Mother Nature truly blessed the island with a breathtaking beauty that has enticed visitors for centuries. And so, it comes as no surprise that for many years, tourism has been a key pillar of the Mauritian economy. The natural beauty of Mauritius is appreciated globally, so much so that the island's attraction has drawn record numbers of visitors in recent years. Tourist arrivals in 2017 and 2018 are reported to have even surpassed the local population. So what does Mauritius seem to be getting right in its tourism sector? I pose this and a couple of other questions to Mr. Arvind Bundan, the man at the center of the Mauritian Tourism Promotion Authority. Arvind, thanks for chatting with us. Uh, let's get started with Mauritius as an island paradise. This place is gorgeous, but island paradise can be found elsewhere. Just nearby, you have the Seychelles, you've got Zanzibar and the Maldives. What exactly are the characteristics that makes Mauritius stand out? Actually, welcome. Thank you for taking your time to come and see us. If I had to summarize, Mauritius is beyond a beach destination. Okay, you have thousands of islands in the world with pristine beaches, with clear blue sky. But what makes Mauritius unique is that Mauritius is a melting cauldron of diversity, of culture, of religion, of uh, uh, ethnicities. And uh, I think that's, that's one thing that we want to showcase the world. And you know, as the tourism industry has grown over the years, can you walk us through the different steps in the evolution of this business and also how it's diversified? Actually, tourism has proved to be one of the backbone of the, of the Mauritian economy. And tourism started those days, we were very Eurocentric. Most of the tourists came from France, from the UK, where you had direct flights at that time. And, uh, and slowly, we diversified our market. That's where Asia is extremely important because I would mention that you have quite a good GDP growth in Asia and Asians are very thirsty of discovering exotic islands like Mauritius. And that's one of the reasons we diversified our industry and went into these emerging markets. We started, I mean, right, we started with hotels with guest houses, then you had hotels along the coast, and you shouldn't occur the fact that Mauritius is a beach destination and people want to stay on the coast. But nowadays we've, we've seen a, a quite a, re a reversing trend, I would say. You've got more and more villas with the implementation of the integrated resort schemes and the residential estate schemes and people are renting more and more. And finally, you have the, also the upsurge of ecologies, which are very popular nowadays. 
Now, I want to talk about the different types of things that people can do in Mauritius. As you said, it's not just another beach destination where you can lie around. There are a lot of things to do here on this island. I would stress on the fact that you know, Mauritius can boast of having very pure air. It's not only a beach destination where you have fascinating water sports, but the interiors of Mauritius are worth discovering. As I told you, within a radius of 50 meters, you have a mosque, a pagoda, a temple, a church. This is one of the specificity of Mauritius, you know. Secondly, I would say, in terms of activities, inland activities, you've got loads of them. You've got, you know, uh, all these uh, lodges where you have zip lining, you have uh, um, quad biking, you have golf, which is extremely popular, you have uh, kite surfing, and actually sports is becoming more and more popular in this, uh, I mean, within our calendar of activities that we organize. I suppose it's good for the local Mauritians to be active and participating in these sports as well. Speaking of the local population, there's about 1.3 million people living here. And in fact, your annual number of tourists coming here exceeds your national population. And I understand the revenues um, as a percentage of the GDP is more than 10%. Can you tell us the role tourism plays in your economy and for your country? It's tourism, as I mentioned, it's one of the backbone of the economy. Huh? and you've got around 10% employment generated from the industry, direct and indirect employment. And, uh, and, uh, and tourism, our plan, our mission, our strategic plan is to grow by 20, 2030, to grow up to 2 million tourists. That's our objective. And uh, obviously, you know, there's a significant relation between uh, number of arrivals and the GDP. I mean, is there a problem with such a heavy reliance on one sector, though? No, we, c we have quite a diversified economy, actually. The first, the backbone of the economy is still manufacturing. Secondly, it's um, uh, financial services. Third is tourism. Now, but we are try trying to grow the, the tourism industry uh, substantially, gradually, and also uh, in, a, um, in a competitive manner, actually. Are there any other downsides to the tourism business? You know, like everything in life, there's a good part and a bad part. And uh, I think uh, what we should mention is that we are, drying, we are growing the, the, the industry gradually. We don't want over-tourism, neither mass tourism. Mauritius stays is a luxury destination. It's in the top mind of the HNI, high net wealth individuals. Our strategy right now is to consolidate our core markets. And at the same time, we're di diversifying and going into these emerging markets. Like China is one of the examples. You know, the outbound capacity of tourism from China is enormous and we really want to capture a little bit of this market, okay? Secondly, we went to Saudi Arabia also, whereby, you know, we have had a lot of campaigns, social media, traditional, conventional also, and uh, just to, to strategize and to capture these markets. Well, it's interesting, what have you done to cater to the different needs and preferences of these different markets? Actually, this is, this is a, this is quite a challenge because, you know, Mauritius at a certain point of time was known to be very Eurocentric. The European has a different eating habit, drinking habit, culture than the Asian tourists. So, I mean, like, I would like to highlight that hoteliers and even Mauritians have put a lot of efforts in the to, to cater for this market, to, for these, for, to aspire to cater for this for these big markets. The United Nations has come out and said that climate change is a threat to island nations. What have you put in place to protect the tourism industry as we move forward? Yes, climate change is a big challenge for small islands like us, definitely. What we are putting in place now is like in almost all properties, 
we are encouraging hotels to eco-label themselves or eco, uh, hotels and tourism residences to eco them to eco-label themselves we've got a lot of energy uh, saving uh, mechanisms that are being put in place the government is giving a lot of grants to all these uh, tourists or hotels to 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 go and uh, embrace this this path actually and you know in terms of uh, the niche in the development of ecotourism around the world has mauritius done anything to capture this sector actually this is the trend that's one of the reason you find a lot of uh, properties being built inland and uh, i think mauritius has a crucial role to play we are known as a beach destination but we haven't occulted the fact that it is the trend and we are encouraging people uh, we are encouraging uh, investors to invest in these lodges or eco-friendly uh, tourist residences whereby you know you can attract the millennials looking for experience thank you right. well we're off to go see mauritius thank you so much for taking time uh, to please chat enjoy with us mauritius always. thank you very thank much you. from my conversation with arvind it seems that proactive management of the tourism sector is setting Mauritius apart from would-be competitors for top tourism dollars. With many efforts steered towards ensuring that visitors of diverse backgrounds all get to enjoy a piece of Mauritius, it seems clear to me that Mauritius wants you to visit not just once, but again and again. We'll take a short break now, but do stay tuned. Talk Africa will be right back with more of Mauritius in a moment. Cosmopolitan hubs that make up the cities in Mauritius reveal a bustling economy, powered by activities way beyond tourism. The literacy rate for this upper middle income country is estimated at 93%, and infrastructure is also developing, with funds increasingly being earmarked for the country's highways of growth. Altogether, an enabling combination of factors have propelled the Mauritian economy to become one of the most competitive in Africa and the world. Mauritius is establishing itself as a prime destination to do business. The World Bank now ranks Mauritius as 20th in the world and top in Africa in the ease of doing business report for 2019. To find out more about the emerging economic front, I speak to Mr. Francois Guibert, the CEO of the Mauritius Economic Development Board. Hi Francois, thank you so much for taking time to chat with us on Talk Africa. For 2019, the World Bank actually named Mauritius as the easiest country to do business in Africa. In fact, you were also ranked number one uh, for Africa on the Global Competitive Index. It's, um, the list of accolades goes on and on. And in your own words though, you've said the Mauritius is a small country with little natural resources and limited human resources. So I want to ask, what are the factors that made all these achievements possible? 
Well, first of all, I'm glad that you mentioned that we are, if I can use this word, in the G20 of the world ranking. So for me, it's a fantastic positioning that we got at the end of October last year. And we are very proud to be number one in Africa and number 20 in the world. Uh, indeed, the size doesn't matter too much. I've been in countries which are smaller in terms of geography and which are extremely powerful. So uh, this is a combination of on the way that we are um, combining both, say, manufacturing, high tech, and finance all together to become an attractive place for most of the key countries that wants to invest in Africa. In other words, we would like to, to play this uh, role that, for example, Singapore has been playing with ASEAN and even with Asia. We like to play it with uh, Indian Ocean economy and also, of course, the huge Africa continent. And in fact, your agency, the Economic Development Board, as I understand it, was formed recently through a consolidation of other agencies, such as your Board of Investment and so forth. Can you tell us about the aim of this restructuring and how that's made it easier for you to attract more businesses and investments? I think the combination of the three entities, the one of BOI, the Board of Investment for FDI, the one of Enterprise Mauritius for taking care of export of product, in the one of FSPA for the promotion of the financial place was a good combination of all interaction, uh, interaction with the world outside. In other words, when you go outside, you go to visit potential investors, which are also potentially uh, importers of products from Mauritius, who are also interested by the financial place. So we have one entity now that can talk on the free activities at the same time with one voice. And I think that it's a fantastic plus to be recognized as there is many EDBs in the world. There is EDBs in Singapore, there is EDBs in Africa and in some other country. And they are gathering all this capability of uh, offering a one-stop st shop, I may say, uh, for everything concerning investment, export. And, and also, in our case, we have the ease of doing business in our mandates, the strategic economic planning. and the one of uh, branding of Mauritius. And the branding beyond the one of, of course, the beautiful place of Mauritius for the tourism and so on, but the branding of Mauritius as a place also to do business for Indian Ocean and Africa. But as you said, there are many other places that are positioning themselves to compete with you. So what are your competitive advantages? We have 10 ingredients that make us very specific. Some of the countries may have a few of them, but we have all of them. And I can disclose the 10 ones. The first one is we have a protection on IP. We have a good level of education and manpower. We have rule of law and political stability since the foundation of Mauritius, which was 1968. Then we have a high level of security. Security for people, security for enterprises, and security for data. Then we have our world ranking of number 20 and number one in Africa in all, for all indexes. Then we have the one of uh, structural very low tax rate of 15% for both individual and companies. And then we have also the capability of offering uh, trade uh, support in terms of arbitration courts, in terms of stock market. Uh, we have also a financial system which allow uh, the country to have free flow of uh, cash between uh, Africa, Mauritius and all other countries in the world in different currencies, which is very difficult in many African countries. And the standard of living that you mentioned before, which is obviously uh, uh, very well recognized already. So all these 10 ingredients are very specific and very unique. Some of the African countries may have a few of them, but we have all of them, and we believe that this is a competitive advantage. And in fact, today, Mauritius is a very diverse economy, right? But not long ago, just a few decades ago, this was a country that was dependent on one crop, the sugarcane. How was it, and what were the push and pull factors that made this transition uh, I don't know if I can say smooth or seamless, but it seems to have happened. What facilitated this diversification? 
Well, I think that there was also both internal and external uh, reason to move quickly to uh, sugarcane, to textiles, and to finance and so on. But in the strategy of EDB today, we are trying to combine all of that. We are trying to accelerate what is already working well. Not all the sugarcane is doing well, of course, but we are trying to help the one of the customized, the high-end product of the sugarcane, and also the, the link product to the sugarcane, not only the sugar. Uh, indeed, we are talking about the sugarcane itself. Then on the textile, we are uh, really having a strategy of helping uh, key manufacturers to become more competitive on a worldwide basis by automation, by uh, maybe uh, um, taking all, let's say, the actors to be sure that they know how to develop the entrepreneurship spirit for the next generation of people. We are trying to uh, give them access to financing in better conditions than before. So to, to really to have the ecosystem to make it successful also in the high-end and the uh, specialized, let's say, product. The, the one with, where we have uh, uh, product coming from uh, uh, ecological uh, textile capabilities and so on. So we have a full program to support them with a lot of incentive and a lot of uh, support uh, from some spe specialized consultant and so on. And on finance, of course, we are already a big financial place. So we believe that here we, we can also continue to develop, but we have already a good recognition of the financial place in Indian Ocean and for Africa. What we do also is to diversify. We want to have other sectors of the industry. We want to have pharmacy, energy, transport, many other activities which are mature segment, but which have still a lot of potential of development, both in Mauritius, in Indian Ocean, and Africa. And then we are trying to innovate. So accelerate, diversify, innovate. Innovate in all key sectors, of course, of high tech at large. Whatever fintech, whatever biotech, whatever I take in general, uh, and also in some sector like uh, the movie industry or in uh, some uh, uh, special license to, uh, for the fintech to operate when there is no particular law and regulation to give them license to test their ideas. In other words, to develop the entrepreneurship. So that's the three major part of our strategy. And, and we do it on the three major block, the key pillar of manufacturing, uh, high-tech, and finance. If you combine both of them uh, all together, generally you, you have a good chance to, to have some kind of success. And for domestic economic growth, I believe what you said is you wanted to have a high-income economy that's inclusive, sustainable, and independent. Can you break that down for us, and can you tell us where the gap areas are in achieving that vision? What I can say is that indeed there is a combination here of local and international players. And that's what makes the success of every key island and key economies that want to uh, really uh, become very powerful and independent. So the idea is indeed to, to be open uh, to a lot of new ideas, to be an education hub, to be a retirement hub, to be a technical hub for Africa, and therefore to become more and more independent with key players starting to set up their operation in Mauritius. In fact, the key ingredients, the 10 ones that I, I was mentioning before, are indeed to bring regional headquarters from key potential investors from Europe, from Asia, in particular India, China, and Japan. And we believe that uh, a lot of the key position in an organization like accounting and finance, IT, HR, communication, training, all that kind of staff function can be safely and smartly be based in Mauritius and not be duplicated 54 times in Africa. So uh, manufacturing and sales, of course, could be in Africa itself. The market is here and we understand that. But we believe that uh, uh, even a safe and smart place to operate your regional headquarters or even your competence center, depending on the size of the company. 
but uh, will allow you to operate safely, smartly. And this is consistent with the Africa strategy that you've articulated. And one can almost see through this new Africa strategy, Mauritius taking a move further, whereas before it was just a platform for investments going into Africa. But it seems like now with the Africa strategy, you actually want a piece of the action. You're trying to play a leadership role through SADEC, through Kamesa. Is that, is that in fact the case? What is your Africa strategy? The African strategy is indeed in two ways. First of all, to become the regional headquarter for Africa. And the second one is to, uh, because of government to government agreement that has been set up in the past uh, few years between uh, the two governments of uh, some African countries, five of them, uh, we can operate some special economic zone, and which is a kind of joint venture between the two countries. And therefore, we believe that uh, that will help both our local investors and international investors to start to operate in the key strategic countries of Africa to develop their business locally. And we believe that uh, we are the only country maybe that can open, let's say, the door of such uh, African country to potential investors worldwide. Now, internationally, on the international perspective, you have articulated that Mauritius is going to try to replicate perhaps the Singaporean economic model and maybe even one day surpass it. And you talk about other places in Africa. There's a country, Rwanda, which I'm sure you're aware of, that calls itself the Singapore of Africa. There's also South Africa and Kenya waiting in the wings. So what does Mauritius have? We, we don't want to compete with Singapore. The, we want to be sure that we can extract the ingredient of success that they have been enjoying in the past 35 years to be sure that we can uh, not copy and paste but adapt it to our context. We are a different island, we are three times bigger in terms of size, but we are in different uh, locations, we have different geography, culture, history and relationship with Indian Ocean and uh, Africa in the world. So we have to make it our way but I believe that the ingredients that they have used are common, let's say, common ingredients of success that can be in some way deployed in, in our case. And therefore, we believe that we can be in some way the Singapore of Africa, like they have done for ASEAN and for Asia, but our own way. Um. You had working experience across greater China. Now, Mauritius is trying to establish itself as a bridge between China and into Africa. How do you see this playing out? I have to say that I'm impressed by the relationship of Mauritius with China. Uh, I was uh, involved in uh, the trip that was done during the uh, Africa Forum in uh, Beijing in early September. And uh, I was impressed on the way China was greeting Mauritius, uh, both at the top level of, uh, of the political level with uh, the president of China, the prime minister of China, the key representative of uh, business organization and companies. We have had a trip which was, uh, I have to say, fantastic. So I have to say that a fantastic job has been made in the past uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 years with China uh, to be really a partner for Africa. Francois' assertions of the promise Mauritius has to offer are evident from indicators such as the UN's Human Development Index, where Mauritius ranks number two in Africa. And indeed, beyond the sublime natural beauty that Mauritius has become famous for, it will be man-made vision, sound policies, and determination that will propel this island paradise to its rightful place in the world. And that's all we have time for this week on Talk Africa. A big thank you to all our guests on this episode for sharing their insights. Remember to catch this and more episodes of Talk Africa on our YouTube playlist and the CGTN Africa website. We'd also love to hear your feedback through our social media handles on Facebook and Twitter. Do keep the conversation going and tune in again next week for more of Talk Africa. From Mauritius, I am Liu Fei Fei. See you next time. Mm -hmm.